You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is, Jacob Volk. Of the Jacob Volk Show, I am Jacob Volk, and I have to start with a move that my beloved Yankees made, and it's one that I didn't see coming. I thought this guy was done being a Yankee. I thought they were going to move on from him. I thought them adding Jay Bruce put the kibosh on this guy coming back. But he's back. He's going to give it one more go. At least. That, of course, is Brett Gardner, who signed a one-year deal worth $4 million. And if the Yankees exercise the team option that they have on him for not this coming season, the season after, he'll make about $11 million. Make no mistake about it, this is a good move by the Yankees. The thing about the Yankees is they want to keep their... Lifetime Yankees around for their whole career. Gehrig, DiMaggio, Mantle, Jeter, Rivera, Mattingly, Georgie, Bernie. Hell, if it was up to them, Andy Pettit never would have left for Houston. And make no mistake about it, Gardner has been the perfect Yankee in how he comports himself. You never hear any extracurricular stuff about him. He doesn't want the headlines. He just goes out there and does his job every day. I mean, make no mistake about it. He is this generation's Roy White. Another lifetime Yankee. And let's be honest. Who would you rather see as the fourth or fifth outfielder? Jay Bruce or Brett Gardner? My answer is Brett Gardner. I'm not saying Bruce would be bad in that role. I would just rather see Gardner there. I mean, I like Gardner. I want him to spend his whole career with the Yankees. I think the Yankees are doing the right thing by bringing him back. It's just interesting when it comes to the fit. Gardner hasn't been the primary backup in a long time. You want to tell me last year he was supposed to be the backup? That's not really true. Because you gotta remember, before the pause, Aaron Judge had this mysterious injury that no one knew anything about. It took a while to diagnose it. And there was a real question of would he be ready on opening day? That opened up a spot for Gardner. Talkman would have moved over to right, and Gardner would have played left. At this very moment, Gardner's probably the fifth outfielder. 
And it's fair to wonder, if the Yankees are so gung-ho on staying under the luxury tax, is this the best use of $4 million? According to Cots Baseball Contracts, the Yankees have just over $6.5 million in luxury tax space. Now that's counting Gardner. So you may be asking yourself, Jacob, what are you talking about? This move doesn't put them over the luxury tax. You're right, it doesn't. But there is this thing called the trade deadline. I know that Brian Cashman usually stays quiet at the deadline. But wouldn't you like him to have the flexibility to add a game changer? You're not going to be able to do that with $6 million. $10 million? It's possible. Also, minor league demotions and promotions count towards the luxury tax. So, with money being an issue, is this the best use of $4 million? Also, what Brett Gardner are the Yankees getting? Are they getting 2019 Brett Gardner, who hit 28 home runs and 74 RBIs? Or are they getting last year's Brett Gardner, where he hit 223, only hit 5 homers and 15 RBIs? I mean, God only knows how much Gardner has left in the tank. Do you want this guy playing a lot? That's the question. Because you know Judge is going to spend some time on the I.L. You know Hicks is going to spend some time on the I.L. You know Stanton's going to spend some time on the I.L. You're going to see Gardner a lot. I'm not saying he's going to play 140 games, but Gardner will get opportunities to play. And I'll tell you, there's a sizable percentage of Yankees fans that don't want that. They don't want to see Gardner play a lot. I got to be honest with you. I understand it. See, there's a misnomer that people have about Yankees fans' opinions of Brett Gardner. They don't hate Brett Gardner. They really don't. They just hate the fact that he has to play a lot. They hate the fact that he took a lot of playing time away from Clint Frazier. Now that's not a problem because... Frazier's going to start in left field on opening day. And that's the right decision. As skeptical as I am of Frazier, he's earned that right. Will he keep it throughout a full season? God only knows. But he's earned the right to get first crack at it. I'll tell you... I'm skeptical. I'm not the biggest Frazier fan. I know I had to eat my words last year. I get it. But he's got to do it again in a 162-game season. That's only fair. The one thing I don't want to hear is if Frazier lays an egg, people saying... Oh, look at what he did last year. He hit 267. He hit eight homers, 26 RBIs. What are you talking about? This guy has talent. I don't want to hear that. You've got the ball, Frazier. Run with it. No excuses. 
But there were a lot of Yankees fans that wanted to see Frazier play over Gardner. That's where the hatred comes from. They don't hate Gardner the player. Five years from now, when Brett Gardner returns for Old Timers Day, he'll get a standing ovation. They just hate the fact that he took playing time away from Frazier. I mean, it does bring up an interesting question. What does the outfield depth chart look like? When you need to take Frazier, Hicks, or Judge out of the lineup, who's going to have first crack at filling that hole? Gardner or Mike Talkman? I hope it's Talkman. I'll tell you, I like Talkman a lot. He's the forgotten guy in all this. You know, I'll tell you, Talkman actually reminds me of Gardner. A guy who's going to hit for a decent average, have a really good glove, have some speed. Gardner in his day had more speed than Talkman, but no one steals now anyway. I hate that, don't get me wrong, but it's the truth. He's also a clutch player, has some power, This may age horribly, there's no question, but I have more faith in Talkman at this very moment than I do uh, Clint Frazier. It wouldn't surprise me at all if the Yankees had to bench Frazier for Talkman. I mean, could Gardner take playing time away from someone? The answer is yes. But it's probably not going to be Frazier, at least not right away. It could be Talkman. I don't want that. I mean, Jay Bruce, assuming he would have made the team, he wouldn't have taken playing time away from Talkman. Bruce just would have been the pinch hitter if you needed a home run threat late in the game. I can tell you it's not going to sit well with anyone if Gardner isn't used a lot. That's my concern with this. The fit. How does Gardner fit in the Yankees outfield? What's his role really going to be? I don't mind bringing Gardner back. I like Gardner. And 4 mil is a fair contract for him. But... I'd rather have some flexibility to make any mid-season moves that you need to. And also, I don't want Gardner taking playing time away from Frazier or Talkman. As skeptical as I am of Frazier, he's earned some leash. And Talkman should be the primary backup outfielder. There's no question about that. It's not a bad move. It's just a move that makes you ask a lot of questions that there are no answers to right now. That's what's scary. Moving on now to the Rays, bringing back Chaz Rowe. On a one-year deal worth 1.15 mil. And this is a good move for the Rays. Rowe has been a really good reliever for the Rays for a long time. Last year, he went 2-0 with a 2.89 ERA. The year before, he went 1-3 with a 4.06 ERA. I'll take that. Rowe's a guy who you can put into the back end of the bullpen as a middle reliever, and he'll hold his own. You take a look at the Rays bullpen right now, there are guys ahead of Rowe, and that's correct. That's the way it should be. 
Obviously, you've got Nick Anderson as the closer. You've got guys like Pete Fairbanks, Diego Castillo, Ryan Thompson. And then there's Rowe. That's the makings of a solid bullpen. Not a great bullpen. I don't think it's going to carry the Rays to a playoff spot like it did last year. But I don't think it'll embarrass itself. Here's what I'll say about the Rays. I think they'll be over 500. I think they'll get 85 wins. But I don't think they're making the playoffs. I just think they've lost too much talent. I don't see how they make it up. All right, now I'll give you some NBA vault talk. And another Houston Rocket is about to see his time with his team end. That, of course, is DeMarcus Cousins. Now, you gotta wonder what the Rockets are thinking here. Is Boogie the Boogie of old? The answer is no. But the Rockets just guaranteed his salary. It doesn't matter if they waive him before Wednesday. He's still going to be on the Rockets' books. I mean, the Rockets gave this stupid explanation. Oh, we wanted to do that to show appreciation to him because of how he conducted himself. This guy's been a Rocket for 25 games. You owe nothing to him. You can waive him. That's okay. That would make more sense. No one would begrudge you for that. The reality is, Boogie is a shell of his former self. It's really sad because once upon a time, this guy was one of the best centers in the NBA. He made four straight All-Star teams. He was putting up like 25 points a game. Double-double threat every night. Really good defender. Then the injuries happened. He got hurt with the Pelicans, went to the Warriors, only played 30 games, missed last year with an ACL injury, and you saw it on the court. He wasn't as mobile as he was in years past. Big men with foot problems, man. Nothing worse than that. I mean, could you find a team willing to trade for Boogie? The answer is yes. He's only making 2.3 mil. A lot of teams can squeeze that in very easily. And it's not like he was bad this year. He just wasn't great. Put up 9.5 points per game and and 7.5 rebounds per game. Now his field goal percentage plummeted, but that's because he was taking more threes. And you know what? He wasn't terrible from beyond the arc. 33.5%. For a big man, I'll take that. That means you have to respect him. Now let me tell you a little story. It's the end of the 09-10 season. The New Jersey Nets had gone 12-70. and 70. They were an embarrassment to sports. The silver lining was that they were going to get John Wall. They had the best odds in the lottery. Wall was... The obvious first overall pick. It seemed like John Wall was going to be in net. The ping pong balls didn't fall the Nets' way. They got the third overall pick. 
Wall went to the Wizards. Evan Turner went to the 76ers. They were the obvious first two picks. Then came the third overall pick. A lot of people said that the Nets were going to take Derek Favors. I didn't want Favors. I wanted DeMarcus Cousins. You got to realize this is before the NBA went small. It went positionless. You could have two old school big men playing together and it would work. I mean, when I watched Cousins at Kentucky playing with John Wall, I saw a superstar in the making. I was screaming for Cousins. I knew it wasn't going to happen, but I really wanted it. The Nets took favors. Didn't even last a full season with the Nets. He was traded to the Jazz in the Darren Williams trade. Ten-year anniversary of that tomorrow, by the way. Not to go too far down the rabbit hole, but that trade worked. Alright, did Darren Williams do some infuriating things in the playoffs with the Nets? Yes. But he gave them an identity, he gave them a superstar that they could market around. As they were moving to Brooklyn, he re-upped with the Nets, he didn't sign with the Mavericks right away. That trade worked. I don't care what anyone says. That trade worked. It is time to atone for the mistake of taking Derek Favors over DeMarcus Cousins. Boogie fits the net perfectly. Here's a big who can stretch the floor. He gives them a bully in the interior. Because, let's be honest, DeAndre Jordan hasn't been that this year. I know he had a great game yesterday. The Nets swept their West Coast trip. First time they've ever done that. They went 5-0. and They're the team to beat in the NBA. But the Nets do need a big man. There's a reason so many Nets fans are desperate to see Nick Claxton back on the floor. All due respect to Claxton, I think he can be a solid NBA player. I'd rather have DeMarcus Cousins. Think about this rotation for a minute. James Harden, Kyrie Irving, Joe Harris... Kevin Durant and DeMarcus Cousins who is better than DeAndre Jordan at this very moment. Again, Boogie's not bad. He's just not great anymore. And off the bench, let's say Bruce Brown, Landry Shamit, Andre Roberson, Jeff Green, and DeAndre Jordan. I know I'm leaving out Tyler Johnson and Timothy Luabu Cabarro. And I'm on Shumpert, too. You've got options if you're Steve Nash. There's no question. But, notice, regardless of what way you slice it, the Nets need a big man. You've had Bruce Brown in that role at different points in the year. You've had Durant in that role. You've had Jeff Green in that role. See, going small works offensively for the Nets because they have so many guys who can create their own shots. They have guys who are great catch and shooters. It works offensively. Defensively, it doesn't. Usually, the Nets give up a lot of points in the paint. Now, they've been better defensively, 
as of late. There's no question. But a guy like Boogie would go a long way towards helping the Nets. And he's probably easier to get than a guy like Drummond or Griffin or a guy like that. Now, the one caveat is Cousins said some things about James Harden that probably didn't endear Boogie to the beard. So if Harden doesn't want to play with Boogie, okay, fine. I can live with that. It's not life or death for the Nets to get Cousins. It would make sense. It'd make perfect sense. But if Harden's dead set against it, okay. I'll wait for Drummond. But if Harden and Cousins are willing to let bygones be bygones, the past is the past, we'll forget about the Rockets, it's uh, all about the Nets right now, Cousins would make a ton of sense. Moving on now to the Timberwolves firing Ryan Saunders and replacing him with Chris Finch. This is not on an interim basis, by the way. Chris Finch, a guy who started out the weekend as an assistant coach for the Raptors, is now the head coach of the Timberwolves. Even though it's unusual for a team to hire another team's assistant coach mid-season and say that guy is our full-time head coach, it hasn't happened since the Grizzlies hired Lionel Hollins from the Bucks. In 2009. This can work. You've got to realize. Gerson Rosas. The Timberwolves president of basketball operations. And Finch. Have a history. From 2011 to 2016. Finch was an assistant coach for the Rockets. You know who was in the Rockets front office at that time? Gerson Rosas. In fact, a report came out today from John Krasinski of The Athletic that said that Finch was at the top of Rosas's wish list ever since he first got to the Timberwolves. So if this is the guy who you really think can lead the Timberwolves to success, yeah, do whatever you have to do to make that happen. I don't mind that. It's certainly unusual that you're throwing Finch into the fire right away. This guy is going to have no time to learn his roster, no time to learn his coaches. He's got to hit the ground running, and he has 50-pound leg weights on. That's not going to work. I understand that... The Timberwolves are dreadful this year. Alright, there's no way on this earth that they're making the playoffs. They're the worst team in the NBA. But, the reality is when you're first taking over as a head coach... You have a limited time to make a first impression on the fan base. You can't punt the next 41 games away. 
I don't care that the Warriors get your first rounder unless it lands in the top three. If you don't put a respectable product out there, no one's going to believe in you. The fans aren't going to believe in you. The players aren't going to believe in you. Maybe Rosas will, but look, you're going to be behind the eight ball for a really long time. You don't want that. You've got to show that you can whip this team into shape. Now, let me just say that I think this hire can work. Chris Finch is well-regarded in league circles for his offensive mind. And this is a Timberwolves team that has struggled offensively. Anthony Edwards really hasn't been able to develop a shot. Look, he had a thunderous dunk on Yuta Watanabe the other day. But at the end of the day, he's got to shoot better than 31.3% from beyond the arc. Josh Okoji needs to get his act together. Jared Culver really needs to get his act together. I'd like to see Jordan McLaughlin used a little bit more. Finch can whip these guys into shape. I have no issue with that. And some people are saying that this year isn't Ryan Saunders' fault. Towns has only played in 11 games. Russell has only played in 20 games. Somehow, and I don't even know how this is possible, but somehow, that star duo, Towns and Russell... A duo that I raved about last year. A duo that should work. Has only played in five games together. That's it. Yeah, maybe Saunders didn't get the fairest of shakes. But this is the NBA. This is a results-oriented league. Since Towns came back on February 10th, the Timberwolves are 1-7. They had the opportunity to beat the Knicks the other day. They couldn't get the job done. I mean, let's be honest. Do you really think that Ryan Saunders could have taken the Timberwolves to the same heights that his father did? Playoff appearances every year. A Western Conference Finals run. The answer is no. He couldn't have done it. The reality is Ryan Saunders just isn't that good a coach. I mean, what helped him get the job was the fact that he's Flip Saunders' son. Nepotism is real. But once you get your foot in the door, I don't care who your father is, you've got to show some results. And this guy, in his career, has a 43-94 and record. That's not going to get the job done. The Timberwolves know that they need to make it work quickly. Towns and Russell may be great friends, but if they keep losing, that's going to wear on. You'll have a big issue on your hands. I don't mind this move at all. I think it can work. I think it's the right decision by the Timberwolves. I think Finch can work out. I think he can whip this offense into shape. Rosas pursued Russell for a long time. He got him. And Rosas pursued Finch for a long time. He got him. 
pretty soon it's gonna be put up or shut up time for him. All right, now I'll give you some NFL vlog talk. And I'll start with the Packers cutting Christian Kirksey and Rick Wagner. The Packers are in cap hell. Make no mistake about that. They created just over 10 mil in cap space. And they're still... 11 and a half mil over the salary cap. They've got some tough decisions to make going forward. Kirksey and Wagner were never expected to be Packers for a long time. They were given a shot because the Packers had some holes to fill at linebacker and offensive tackle. And they had good track records. They were moves that made sense. It was just hard to rally behind them and say, Yeah, we got Christian Kirksey and Rick Wagner. We're Super Bowl contenders. The Packers always have underwhelming free agencies. Kirksey really did not have a good year for the Packers, according to Pro Football Focus. He had just a 43.9 overall grade. That's the worst grade he's had in his career. He also got hurt. He missed five games. He hasn't played 16 games since 2017. He got a big contract from the Browns once upon a time, and it didn't work out. I don't mind the Packers cutting him at all. I expect them to target a middle linebacker in the draft. Jeremiah owusu Koromoa would make perfect sense. As for Wagner, it's hard for me to get behind that. He was a really good right tackle for the Packers. He had a 77 overall grade. That's the second highest mark of his career. There are two things the Packers need to do with Aaron Rodgers. Number one, give him some skill position players. And number two, keep him upright. I'd have liked the Packers to have figured out a way to keep Wagner around. Their offensive line was really good last year. It's part of the reason why they went to the NFC title game. It's going to be interesting to see how they fill this hole at right tackle. Moving on now to the Eagles cutting Deshaun Jackson. Even though the Eagles desperately need wide receivers... I don't mind them cutting Jackson in his second stint with the team. He only played in eight games. Is he still a really good deep threat? The answer is yes. He just needs to stay healthy. Jackson will land on his feet. He'll find some team to give him a one-year prove-it deal. And it wouldn't surprise me if Jackson stayed healthy and put together a really good season. But if he gets hurt again, yeah, that's the end of the line for him. And we'll have a real debate about whether he's a Hall of Famer. He's borderline. I'll say that. He has the 41st most receiving yards in NFL history. But in terms of receiving touchdowns, he's out of the top 100. He only made three Pro Bowls. Never won a Super Bowl. Never even made a Super Bowl. The closest he got was 2008, when the Eagles lost to the Cardinals in the NFC title game. 
I'd probably lean towards no for Jackson being a Hall of Famer, but he'll get some votes. There's no question about that. Moving on now to the Panthers, cutting Stephen Weatherly. This makes perfect sense. I've never been a big Weatherly fan. I wanted to like him because he went to Vanderbilt, and my father went to Vanderbilt, but I just didn't see a lot in him. He had one decent year with the Vikings. And that was basically it. He landed with the Panthers a year after that. Started nine games and didn't do anything. He had a 53.7 overall grade, according to Pro Football Focus. He didn't have a sack. The Panthers are in a good spot with the salary cap. They have over $30 million dollars in cap room. They can add a premier defensive lineman. But I'll say this. Albert Breer of Sports Illustrated said that David Tepper, Panthers owner, is quote-unquote obsessed with finding a franchise quarterback. I gotta tell ya, I don't know why they wouldn't just roll with Bridgewater. I didn't think Bridgewater was bad. He threw for over 3,700 yards, completed 69% of his passes, 15 touchdowns to 11 interceptions. Alright, that's not the greatest. But he also ran for 5 touchdowns. You gotta think with Christian McCaffrey coming back, Bridgewater will put together a better season. I understand that the Panthers went 4-11. They were bitten by the injury bug. And I'll say this. If Matt Rule and Joe Brady really are the offensive gurus that everyone says they are, they should be able to make it work with Bridgewater. If I was the Panthers, I wouldn't go crazy over upgrading the quarterback position. Can you do better than Bridgewater? The answer is yes. But you can also do a lot worse than him. Moving on now to the Bills. Supposedly being set to let Matt Milano hit free agency. That comes from John Waro of the Associated Press. And I'm not crazy about that. Assuming it happened, I don't think that's a good idea. I know that Milano had a bad year last year. 55.8 overall grade, according to Pro Football Focus. He only played in 10 games. And only started 5. But, Milano's still really young. He's going to be 26 in a month. This guy has talent. In 2019, he had a 65.3 overall grade. The year before... 76.1. Milano's a good linebacker. I wouldn't be crazy about the Bills letting him walk. If you can get a clear upgrade over him, fine. No one's going to be mistaking Matt Milano for Shane Conlon anytime soon. But he's not bad. You can do a lot worse than him. No, I'd like the Bills to bring Milano back. Also, his cookies are fantastic. I'll close this show out by eulogizing a really smart pitching mind. A guy who was a really good pitcher, a really good pitching coach, 
and played the game the right way. That, of course, is Stan Williams, who died on Saturday at the age of 84 from some kind of heart illness. Stan Williams is one of the most underrated pitchers of the 1960s. When you think of great 1960s pitchers, you think of guys like Bob Gibson, Tom Seaver, Whitey Ford, Sandy Koufax, Don Drysdale, etc., etc., it would take you a long time to get to Williams. And part of that is because... For the first five years of his career, when he was the most dominant, he was pitching behind guys like Koufax and Drysdale. He came up with the Dodgers. But let me tell you, he held his own on those teams. In 1959, when the Dodgers won their first World Series in L.A., Williams had a really good year. He went 5-5 five and five with a 3.97 ERA. He split time between the bullpen and the rotation. He came out of the bullpen during the most important regular season game for the Dodgers that year. The Dodgers and Braves met in a three-game playoff series to determine who would win the NL pennant. The Dodgers won game one, three to two. Larry Sherry pitched an excellent game after he relieved Danny McDevitt. The game after that went into extra innings. The Braves were up 5-2, to two, entering the bottom of the ninth. The Dodgers rallied to score three runs, and they forced extras. Stan Williams came in to pitch those extra innings. He pitched Three innings of scoreless baseball. He didn't give up a hit. He got the win after Felix Mantilla committed a throwing error. The year after that, Williams made the All-Star Games. From 1959 to 1962... Major League Baseball had two All-Star games to raise money for the players' pensions. So even though you'll see that Stan Williams was a two-time All-Star, he only made it one year. But he did have a really good season that year. Went 14-10 and 10 with a 3 ERA. The year after that, he went 15 and 12 with a 3.9 ERA. In 1962, Williams didn't have a good season. In fact, it was probably the worst full season of his career. He went 14 and 12 with a 4.46 ERA. He blew a save in game 2. Of the 62 best of three playoff series between the Dodgers and Giants to determine who would win the NL pennant. That was really the impetus for him being traded. He was traded to the Yankees for Bill Scourn. In 63, Williams had a pretty good season for the Yankees. He went 9 and 8 with a 3-2-1 ERA. But the year after, he was really bad. He went 1 and 5 with a 3-8-4 ERA. 
He split some time between the rotation and the bullpen. That led to him going to the Indians. With the Indians, he thrived. In 67, he went 6-4 and four with a 2-6-2 ERA. He pitched in 16 games. He started 8. The year after that, he went 13-11 and 11 with a 2.5 ERA. He pitched in 44 games and started 24. The year after that, he went 6-14 and 14 with a 3.94 ERA. He pitched in 61 games, started 15. He was traded to the Twins after that season in a pretty big trade at the time. Williams, along with Louis Tion, were traded for Dean Chant, Bob Miller, Greg Nettles, and Ted Ulander. That was really the twilight of his pitching career. In 70, he went 10 and 1 with a 199 ERA. He came exclusively out of the bullpen. And in 71, he split time with the Twins and Cardinals. He went 7 and 5 with a 377 ERA. He was a guy who terrified hitters made sure that the hitters knew that he owned the inside of the plate. You did not want to tick him off. He was six foot five, big, hulking guy. You really didn't want to get on his bad side, and I'll tell you a funny story about Williams in a minute. After he retired, he got into coaching. Was Red Sox pitching coach, White Sox pitching coach, Yankees pitching coach, Reds pitching coach, and Mariners pitching coach. In fact, with the Reds, he was the pitching coach for the Nasty Boys World Series in 1990. And Williams played an integral role in the years that the Nasty Boys had that year. Norm Charlton, Rob Dibble, Randy Myers, Tim Burtsass, and Tim Leana all had excellent years coming out of the bullpen that year for the Reds. Williams was a big part of why. Remember when I said that Williams played the game the right way? And you didn't want to get on his bad side? Some people did. And they ended up on his list. I'm not kidding. He actually kept a list of people that ticked him off. Once you ended up on that list... You were going to get hit. No way around it. Everyone on the list got hit. Except one guy for a long time. Barry Latman. The impetus for this, and this comes from a great book called The Baseball Codes by Jason Turbo. I can't recommend it enough. Excellent book. The impetus for Latman being on the list was in a spring training game, Williams hit Latman's teammate when he was with the Indians, Bubba Phillips. And Williams said it was accidental. But you're expected to stick up for your teammate. Latman hit Williams and Williams was ticked off. Walter Alston pulled Williams from the game right after he got hit. Williams didn't get his revenge. 
He put Latman on the list. The thing is, though, they never crossed paths. That is, until they were both with the Seattle Angels, a minor league team. Williams was pitching batting practice. Latman was taking a few hacks. First thing Williams did was hit Latman with a fastball. And Williams screamed, that's for Vegas. Because the spring training game was in Vegas. With Latman being hit, the list was complete. So Williams threw it away afterwards. Like I said, you didn't want to tick him off. Great baseball mind. Played the game the right way. May he rest in peace. New York Islanders show comes your way tonight. Regular episodes of the Jacob Volk show come your way every weekday afternoon. Also, I want to say this. I've hinted at this for a while. What am I going to do with March Madness shows and an NFL free agency show, even New York Yankees shows with spring training kicking in a high gear. All will be explained on the regular episode of the Jacob Volk Show a week from today, March 1st. I'm going to do it at the end of that show. I think that's the best way to do it. I'll give you some reminders after that, but the first time you'll hear about it is at the end of the March 1st episode of the Jacob Volk Show. I will say this, though. I'm not going to do any New York Yankees spring training shows. Someone asked me that. The answer is no. Until next time, I am Jacob Volk saying that I was never nervous when I had the ball, but when I let it go, I was scared to death.